this. My spirits are not kind. You'll probably hear me talk about them. <laughs> I work with people that have these very kind, gentle ancestors and spirits around them. You're doing great, honey. We're so proud of you. You're so brave. <laughs> my spirits are from Central Asia mostly. And they just, <laughs> they just like to kick me and be like, how was that? <laughs> currently Francis Ullman and I am currently at the French Broad River in Asheville, North Carolina. I think this might be my last day that I'm able to be here because I'm leaving very, very soon. Probably by the time you're watching this, I will be um, possibly back up in Sapmi, Norway side, up in the Arctic. Today we're going to be talking about something called the Eight Vicissitudes. It's a Buddhist teaching, also known as the Eight Worldly Dharmas or the Eight Worldly Preoccupations. I first had this uh, teaching um, shared with me from Sharon Salzberg some years ago now. I saw her when she was giving a talk actually in North Carolina. It just really stuck with me for some reason. It's just something that I took up and I've been working with this a lot. And I found that just kind of sitting with it and holding it as um, something to reflect upon just as I move throughout the world. It really has softened uh, a lot of what used to bring up a lot of tension in me. So I just wanted to share it with you. Traditionally in English, the eight vicissitudes are happiness and suffering, fame and insignificance, praise and blame, loss and gain. For some reason, when I took them up in my mind, I can't remember if I heard this or if it just came up uh, as it got filed away in me. I think of them as pleasure and pain, loss and gain, ignominy and fame, praise and blame. It's said that these eight vicissitudes are something that humans will absolutely experience. You and I, we've experienced uh, all eight of these in our life. And our attachment or aversion to these, they're in pairs of four. One we have attachment to, one we have aversion to. It's not the experience itself, but it's our mind's attachment or aversion to experiencing them that keeps us trapped in our cycles of suffering. So if we can take it upon ourselves not to get rid of the experiences, but to get rid of our attachment or aversion to the experiences, we lessen our uh, karmic load, <laughs> if we can say that. I suddenly saw this as these little like avatars with little karma bars above our heads. <laughs> we can kind of lessen the karma bar maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and and smooth our path as we go along. So a lot of the way I wanted to uh, consider these are especially in relation, not entirely, but especially in relation to how we experience life online. Because if you're watching this, you're watching this on YouTube. And YouTube, Instagram, all TikTok, click clock, these are all um, nightmare scenarios <laughs> for an untrained mind. We want to be able to be witness, to be present with, but without having attachment and aversion to what's coming to us, especially through the screen. So I'm absolutely not offering a complete teaching here. These are just some of my personal reflections on this teaching, and there's a lot more about it online. I encourage you to look it up. This is just me sharing with you. One of the core things that I was thinking about has really brought tremendous benefit to me just in these small eight words. The idea of these eight vicissitudes is as we have attachment and aversion to them, let's say praise and blame. We all love to be praised. We all hate to be blamed. I often think of it as being like a tree. When we're really in um, an unruly mind that just kind of gets pulled like, ah, I want the I want the praise, I want the likes, I want the followers, the blame, oh no, bad comment, I want for it. Like, as we kind of get pulled by each little experience of praise and blame, I think of it as being like a tree and it's like we're up in the leaves. Like everything that happens, we're just, ah, flying around uh, and that's a really uncomfortable place to be what we want to do is to develop the witness moving down lower moving down into the lower parts of the tree just sitting and now this is more an experience of just sitting and witnessing in our deeper sense of self 
as this stream of our karmic experiences unfold and move past us. So the goal is to move from ah, being in the leaves to witness, witness, witness. We all experience the eight vicissitudes. The game is not to get rid of them. The game is to recognize, we don't wanna over-personalize it. That's just what it is to be human. We just witness it and we let it go. Letting go of attachment, letting go of aversion. This is how we lessen our karmic load. So let's think about the first one, loss and gain. I think traditionally loss and gain was talking about mm, like material wealth things stuff. But now we can also think about it in terms of like the, the nightmare of social, like our social reality being in these digital formats that necessarily have metrics go along with them. These metrics, these numbers that are associated with like friends. How many friends do you have? How terrifying is that for someone who is not setting in the witness? Ah, I don't have enough friends. They have more friends. No, 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 no. That really pulls for that loss and gain. So like when I first, I'm just starting this vlog, I um, am still a voice. Sometimes I just feel like in the night, I don't know who I'm talking to. I just feel like I'm talking to the river and maybe some geese will fly past. And I do notice myself checking if someone has watched a vlog post when I post it. My spirits love it. They think it's hilarious. My spirits are not kind. You'll probably hear me talk about them. I work with people that have these very kind, gentle ancestors and spirits around them. You're doing great, honey. We're so proud of you. You're so brave. <laughs> My spirits are from Central Asia mostly. And they just they just like to kick me and be like, how was that? <laughs> So when it comes to me um, starting to feel more um, pulled to have an online presence, what is going on? I think I started sweating just thinking about <laughs> my glasses <laughs> steamed up. So as I start to put myself out there more and more in social media, you know, the first thing that my mind does is I want to, after I post a vlog, I think, well, who watched this? <laughs> like 12 hours later who watched it no one watched it i mean it's not true but it's not exactly um you know at the level of like russell brand so um, my spirits love it as soon as i have that thought they say well check again check again check again and i know <laughs> i noticed after the fourth time they were messing with me what they explicitly said to me was what are you looking for and then they really talked to me through why are you posting these online are you posting these online for gain um, do you feel sadness? Do you feel a sense of loss when people are not watching them? Or are you sharing these because this is authentically what's flowing from your uh, causes and conditions of this uh, particular embodiment? And this is just what seems to come out of you. The right, what am I looking for? And they're quickly helping me recognize, reflecting on loss and gain. It doesn't matter how many people follow you. It doesn't matter how many people unfollow you, loss and gain. You just show yourself and then see who comes in. That's the way that we find connection and relations. Coming from here, connections and relations. I can tell you right now, 100%, you are 100,000% worthy. As worthy as the tree, the river, the turkey babies that I saw. Because that's just part of an intrinsic part of who you are. Numbers on social media don't mean anything. And we get trapped in the cycle of loss and gain, looking at these numbers, and it starts to get intertwined with our sense of worth. Toss it. It has nothing to do with who you are. You are a being of light, just as this tree is, just as this river is, just as the air is around us. It's what we're all made of. It's the fabric of our soul. And there's absolutely no information in the numbers around social media. Everyone has a different game. We all woke up and came into this realm with a different deck of cards. I think you're supposed to say set of cards, <laughs> but deck of cards even feels right. <laughs> it's like we're all playing. We're not only are we like having different cards because that implies it's the same game. I think we just are all playing completely different games. Just see what comes and work with what's in front of you. The next one is praise and blame. I was thinking about this in the last couple of days, trying to put this together, and I had this really funny experience. Someone that I'm very close with, I was messaging them. I'm incredibly fast when it comes to messaging. Look at these thumbs, lightning. <laughs> and so uh, the person that was messaging me, they kept having these typos, and I finally was like, you know, I'm sorry, I don't understand what, I just I genuinely kind of lost track of what we're talking about. 
like, let me just ask this question again. Will you just answer me directly? I'm a little bit confused. And they wrote back, well, you're typing so quickly. I'm trying to keep up with you. Praise and blame. That's blame. That's a really nice example because like, dear sweet soul, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's not like I was messaging with my lightning bumps. <laughs> Type faster. <laughs> I'm a patient, slow person. They were putting that pressure upon themselves. And I think there was some um, <laughs> discomfort. I think they might watch this. So hey, <laughs> thanks for letting me use you as an example. I think there was, let's just say some maybe discomfort around having had typos. And rather than just being with, oh, so there were some typos, somehow in the heat of the moment it came out as I had created the typos. That's okay, right? That's how humans work because we're very uncomfortable with making um, mistakes, not being clear when we think we're being clear. But then sometimes we have the habit of blaming others. The trickier ones are the ones that we like, right? Because this is not saying pain, blame, loss. This is, this is putting the two together, right? Pleasure and pain, praise and blame, loss and gain. So when we think about praise and blame, it's okay, probably an easier task to put the blame on them. But if you do something, if you do host an event and everything goes well, if you have an online chat and you're even interviewing someone and a bunch of people watch, People will praise you. That one's trickier. Because when we're not just resting in the witness, when we're insecure, we're not sure who we are, we need proof and we need validation externally. We take, we like seek the praise, right? We it feels good to us. But why does it feel good to be praised? That's moving away from the sense of your true worth. Only you know your true um like orientation of why you're doing your actions. So when our soul and our actions are aligned and we're just moving forward with how we feel called to be using this incarnation, then we can just keep moving along our tracks, right? Praise, thank you, I'm gonna keep going, but I'm not gonna work for the praise. Ignominian fame. So what got filed in my head is ignominian fame. And going back, I see it's fame and insignificance. So reading about it again, it's saying, don't chase after fame. I think we can understand that one. They were saying the flip of fame is insignificance. And there's a lot to work with there. I've been working with the idea of ignominy, as in people um, villainize you. People want to say like, you're the bad influence, right? And I think, I don't know. I read about these teachings online. If you want to go deeper, I am not a teacher on this. I'm just sharing my reflections. I think I can personally connect more with the idea of needing to work with ignominy um, because a lot of us that are walking these paths, we find ourselves kind of being like the black sheep. Oftentimes we feel like the outsider. And some of us, when we're still seeking external validation for who we are, that can be really difficult. The fame feels good. The fame feels good because it's like proof of our fruits of our spiritual practice. Like, do you hear how bananas that is when we say it out loud? Fame is not a real thing. I mean, it's a real thing, but it's there's no like inherent value in fame. People who are famous never seem to say that they're happier. And a lot of them that are honest about it say, if anything, it's made me less happy. But I do have a hard time with the ignominy, you know, like my background being, I was a clinical psychologist. I was licensed and in practice and working in like a respectable member of society. And now I'm out and being very public saying, I think clinical psychology got it wrong. Um, I hear voices. There are gonna be a lot of people that I knew in my past life <laughs> that are gonna be labeling me. They're gonna be using words against me that uh, we all know what those words are. We don't need to say them here. At words that have nothing to do with me, they're gonna diminish me. Um, they're going to look for all reasons to pick me apart because they don't like the messages that I'm sharing. That also becomes something that I can't use to dictate what I'm doing. I have to just continue to move forward and say, well, but this is my story. I know coming out with my story right now, I'm going to have a lot of people coming against me. And in fact, I already have. I've had more than one person literally look me point blank in the eye. One time I was in an airplane. I mean, like in an airplane, we had a couple more hours. And he kind of was asking me what I was doing. And I was like, uh, it's a little strange. And he kind of asked me more and more. And um, uh, I was even pretty gentle about it. He actually, that's right. He, he worked as a mental health professional in the army. But I'm always motivated to be like, well, maybe we'll plant a seed. And his response to me was, well, I just think you're crazy. He was quite comfortable telling this to me.
we just sat there with our little <laughs> drinks <laughs> flying across the currently called USA for a couple more hours. It's a little odd. If I am experiencing aversion to ignominy, then to like public declarations that there's something wrong with me, the opposite of fame, then I'm no longer walking my true path. My true path is one that is easily judged these days for many different reasons. So my job is to just continue on, right? And so what are the ways for you? What are the ways that you're called for fame? And in this little like microcosm of social media, fame can mean like 50 likes. And you're like feeling a little bigger and brighter that day. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's so much to work with, right? So what are the ways that, let's call that fame, <laughs> that inflates your ego. And if you post something and no one sees it, maybe that's more the insignificance piece. Um, does that like deflate you for the day, right? Let's just notice, let's zoom up in the leaves, set that aside, right? We're just moving forward, sharing what we share and the right, the right connections will come in. The more and more we're just walking our path and our truth and sharing who we are as we move along with it, not for a need for anything, but just because we're an expression of the infinite. This bird is chirping not for fame. This bird is not worried about uh, the geese nearby judging the song, right? We wanna be more like that. We're just moving our path, seeing what of the beautiful infinite comes out of us, being in the witness, letting go. That's when equanimity comes. So the fruit of this practice I have found uh, really sitting with eight vicissitudes, working with them more and more. And by working with them, I just mean like holding them within me and just being mindful as I walk through my day when I am, which is not all the time. It does slowly lessen <clears throat> the poles of the um, attraction and aversion to these uh, eight vicissitudes. Um, this then grows the seeds of the steadiness, being in the trunk, holding the witness, watching the stream go by. Pleasure and pain. This is the one that I'm not gonna use me uh, social media examples for. What I notice in a lot of spiritually minded um, communities or people that walk in spiritual paths uh, in these more colonized spaces, if something got into our minds. We've got all these kind of strange ideas where we think that an increase of pleasure in our life is related to an increase in like spirituality, that we're doing it better. Again, better is a colonized idea that was given to us, given to us to separate us from understanding our own true worth. There is no such thing as better. No one's better than you. You're not better than your past self. We're just changing and flowing. So what I notice in communities that are trying to walk a spiritual path, there's this idea of like, um, the more pleasure some experiences in their life, they use it almost as like proof within themselves and for other people that like, see, I really am spiritual. Look how amazing my life is. Now I'm on a retreat in Bali. I manifested it. <laughs> you guys, it's not, I don't think that that's the path that Buddha was talking about. <laughs> Nothing says your life gets easier. There is no teaching that I know of that says your life will get easier. It's our relationship with our life that gets easier. You will experience really difficult things. You will experience pain, pleasure and pain. So we're not chasing after the pleasure. It's nice when it comes, but we don't have attachment to it. And then we let it go back into the river, right? Pain will come too. Sickness will come too. Heartbreak, loss, trauma. The spiritual path. There's no teaching I know of that says you won't experience these things. There's no teaching I know of that says evidence of spiritual attainment is loss of difficult experiences. We all have our unique card deck that we're working with and no one knows your story. I don't even think you know your story because you're the story of you. You're the story of your ancestors you the story of the cultural trauma that has been um, imprinted on you. You're the story of the spirits in the land around you. Even these things that can feel very personal that arise, 
I don't think we fully can understand exactly what's going on because everything is so interconnected. And so when I see spiritual people taking on this idea of like, well, they got sick, right? It becomes like a judgment of other people even. It doesn't make any sense to say someone got sick and then, and then that's evidence of like they're off their path or that you're off your path. Sweetie, you're going to get sick and that's okay. You might experience heartbreak. You might experience loss. People you love are going to die. What I love about the eight vicissitudes is it's saying these things happen. This is what it is to be in a human life. None of this is a failing and none of this is a success. Our relationship to these experiences is what we work with. And as we do that, our little avatar karma meter maybe goes down. Equanimity grows. We're in the tree trunk, not up in the leaves. And as steadiness comes, it's just a more comfortable way to walk our path. Maybe take a moment to think for you when we think loss and gain. Are you really averse to loss? Are you really seeking gain? Praise and blame. Do you love to be praised? We've all been little children. Most of us have been taught that we're, we're working and seeking the reward of the praise, right? And most of us, because we've all been little children, have been taught to do anything you can to avoid blame. Do you find that you're really motivated by praise from other people? Do you find that you're really motivated to be adverse to other people blaming you when something goes wrong? Ignominy and fame, or insignificance and fame. Let's think of it as ignominy first. Is it difficult for you when you're known as like the bad guy? Is that uncomfortable for you? Are you seeking after fame? Are you seeking after recognition for what you're doing? Another way that we can think of fame is recognition, wanting recognition for what you're doing, wanting uh, like larger groups of groups around you to be saying, oh, she's so amazing for all the work she's doing for the saving the trees, for saving the bees, or are you just saving the trees and saving the bees? Or let's say insignificance. Is it difficult for you to continue to walk your path, saving the trees and the bees, running a collective? Is it difficult for you when your actions go unnoticed by other humans? That's all we're talking about in that one. Think about pleasure and pain. Do you think one of those two uh, pull you? Attachment to pleasure, aversion to pain? Of these eight, I don't know, if you feel called, just take a moment and what comes to mind for you. Ask yourself, ask your heart quietly. Let's just sit for this moment. Do one or more of these words come to you? Just take a moment and listen. I'll say them out loud and you can see if there's a little ping for you. Pleasure, pain, loss, gain, ignominy or insignificance. Fame, praise, blame. Perhaps that little internal knowing that you have, maybe a little ping on one of those. And perhaps then you can just take it up as a practice for the next couple of weeks. Each time you notice that you're being pulled by attachment or aversion to one of these things, there's nothing to do but notice. Drop it in the stream. Get out of the leaves of the tree, go lower down into the steady branches trunk, be witness. You just do that quietly, gently again and again. It's a very quiet practice, but I promise you, each time you, you find one of those thoughts, attachment or aversion, and basically just label it, that is the moment of letting it go and going back down into that deeper witness. It doesn't take a lot of time or effort. It just takes sort of uh, making the decision to hold this. And I think slowly over the years, you'll find a lot of calm, much more steadiness will come. As always, let's make this a conversation. I'd love to hear what you think. I'd love to hear uh, of the eight of these, which ones have you found that you have been working with already? Um, especially when we think about how it relates to social media, what are the ways that I think uh, the original thinkers of these thoughts maybe didn't consider how it would be extra in these social digital times? Oh, please consider liking and subscribing to feed my opportunity to work with the eight vicissitudes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, 
like and subscribe so we can stay connected. That's the most important thing. Good relations, good relations. I always love to be in connection with others who are working on uh, working on their soul and their spirit along with me. It's a long journey and it's nice to have company. As I was driving here, there was a little family of uh, turkeys um, and they were trying to cross the road and the cars were whizzing bass past, but um, me and another car stopped and uh, I got to watch this little baby turkeys cross the road. They were so cute and I happened to get a video of it. Turkey magic. Thank you. Thank you, great mystery.